don't know if you've ever been involved in the creating process or maybe you've uh, been through orientation, new employee orientation, and you know, you've had to like go through the handbook or go through the, uh, the SOP, the Standing Operating Procedures Manual. Well, having done some of that, where, where exactly do you start? You know, what's, what's the first thing you want to talk about as, you know, as the, the manager? Well, you know, there's, there's, well, we could start off with the benefits package. Everybody wants to know about that. We can go over the rules, right? There, these are the rules of the company or the organization. Um, or we can address like, well, here's some of the warnings. Maybe you start with, well, this is the mission, the vision, and the purpose, usually if you're with a spiritual organization or some kind of Christian nonprofit, you'll begin there. And so where do you begin? Well, in Romans, we, we kind of see a, a layout like that a little bit. In, in the beginning, Romans 1 is kind of that, well, let's start with the mission. Let's start with the, the, the purpose, and that purpose is going to be salvation and Romans 1 really addresses that and talks about how the scriptures the holy scriptures are going to be the the source of that uh, you know that salvation and then there's going to quickly go into some of the the deeds of the flesh as, as it as it is and so what we're going to see is that in Romans that that something's at stake here and and so we, we get into the, to the warnings real quick. We don't get into the vacation package, the benefits, the rewards. It, it's, well, let's, t let's go over what's at stake here. And, and we see right away in chapter 1 words like wrath, words like darkness, corruption, death, judgment. Do you think something's trying to be you know, explained to us? Um, yes, most definitely. It continues right along, and, 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 and Romans chapter 1 rolls right into Romans chapter 2. And remember, when, when Romans was written, it wasn't written with chapters and verses. It's a very difficult thing for us to, to, to get past because all our Bibles have chapters and verses and, and numbers in front of them. That is not how it was written. And so sometimes you see a very clear example of that like the transition from Romans 1 to Romans 2 where it goes from verse 32 and then verse 1 says therefore meaning we're continuing this conversation uh, when you see therefore you should ask yourself uh, yeah what's it there for right and what's before it and so Romans 2 definitely has that that idea so today we're going to see essential warnings from Romans chapter 2 and we're going to see five warnings five essential warnings about the deeds of the heart the deeds of the heart uh, the first one is going to be inexcusable judgment the second one is inevitable consequences sure the third one is inst instructive obedience and fourth will be insincere pride and finally we will look at inward requirements and we'll go over these again inexcusable judgment inevitable consequences instructive obedience insincere pride and inward requirements well beginning at verse 1 chapter 2 we read therefore you're without excuse and we, we need to stop right there, right? Just like, wait a minute. This is like verse 1. And you're telling me, I mean, again, picture yourself in a meeting, right? You've got your little binder, and you open it up, and it says, okay, therefore, you're without excuse. And it's like, I thought the meeting just started, right? See, it's important to have, have context. It's important to understand, okay, this is continuing something. So let's refresh our minds. And we were here last week, but let's let's. Look at what was before, starting in verse 28. And just as they did not see fit according, uh, uh, fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. 
to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Remember, people, uh, verse 24, God gave them over to the lusts of their heart. Verse 26, God gave them over to their degrading passions. The, the creator of the universe gave to the creature his desire. He gave them what they wanted. They didn't want him. They didn't want his ways. So God turned them over to their passions, their lusts. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They do not only do the same, but also give heartily approval to those who practice them. Therefore, you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment, in that you judge another. You condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. And so that should stop us in our tracks. Whoa, wait a second. I was kind of having some fun here, right? Pointing the finger at everybody else. Yeah, the unrighteous. Yeah, the wicked. Yeah, the murderer. And all of a sudden, I'm caught in my own trespass. I say, wait a minute. Do you guys understand here that what's being said, every man of you, every one of us who then passes judgment on people of like manner, you condemn yourself. You do the same things. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, I don't do the same things. Uh, I'm not a murderer, right? Do we do this? Do we walk up to Romans 1, 28 through 31 like it's a buffet line? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't do this. Uh, well, let me look. I don't do murder. I am not a hater of God. I'm not an inventor of evil. But do you understand that if you are, and, and, and this is going to sting, if, if you're disobedient to your parents, okay, then this isn't just for the kids. I mean, I've, I have parents still, um, but especially kids, don't, don't turn your ears down, right? But if you're disobedient to parents, you're in the same sentence as a murderer. If you're unloving, you're an unloving spouse, an unloving parent, you're in the same sentence as a murderer. Um, if you're arrogant, so I'm a little cocky. Is that so bad? Um, I do a little gossip. See, in Romans 2, chapter or verse 1, we see that every one of us, when we pass judgment on others for certain parts of it, you're only heaping judgment on yourself because you're violating one of these. And, in, and this is a, a very difficult thing for us to get our, our minds wrapped around. Moral equivalency, right? I didn't put these things in the sentence. This is, this is God's paragraph. God's the one who morally equates this list with itself. Um, yes, there are different consequence levels to this. But from the standpoint of, of morality, from the, God sees this the same way. That's a hard thing for us to get our mind wrapped around. I, th I think of Job 8.3 and, you know, and Job's buddies said, does God pervert justice? Because this doesn't necessarily seem just, right? That um, shouldn't we cut these down into like Roman numeral 1, sin level 10, DEFCON 5, right? And then kind of go accordingly. No, it's all bundled in there. Um, then we see that when we do this, we... 
We condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same things. Turn with me real quick to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. We're, we're somewhat familiar, and I say that because we're all familiar with parts of this. I wonder if we put it together all the time. You'll hear a lot now, don't judge me, don't judge me, right? Especially in the church, don't judge me. It says don't judge me. It does. Um, but there's more to it than that. Matthew 7, verse 1, Do not judge, lest you be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly, you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, the judgment here isn't judging rightly over sin, that's murder, that's adultery, that's lying. It's again this idea of hypocritical judgment. It's this idea of you who practice the same things. You, you who have a log are judging a speck. Now, I think the irony of all ironies here is we all think the other has the log and we have the speck. Right? Which again makes you look at this list of moral equivalency and say, I don't know that I know the difference between specks and logs. I thought I did, but I'm not sure I do. Um, verse 3, and do you suppose this, O oh man, this is God's way of putting us in our place, um, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same thing yourself that you will escape the judgment of God? Do you really think that somehow pointing out others' faults is going to make God forget your faults? Well, he's worse than me. Well, I know we would never do that, right? Um, you, you don't escape your own consequences. It's I used to do a uh, small claims court. I'd go into uh, uh, small claims in the courthouse for my company. And, and, it, and it was funny because you're sitting there and you know, you're in a, a room filled and there's different cases. And there's all kinds of cases going on. All kinds of crazy, weird things that happen in the world, right? And you think, oh, wow, well, I guess that's breaking the law. I didn't even really know that that was there. I didn't know that was a problem. And, um, and see, the thing is that everybody thinks that their case is unique and special and important, and everybody else's is, oh, that's lame. Why are they even here? It's, you know, well, see, to the, to the, to the law, to the lawmaker, all the laws are important. When you break the law, there's, a, there's going to be a judgment of that law. You're, you're not going to escape uh, the trial. You're not going to escape the process. And we'll get to back to that uh, in, in a little bit. But verse 4, Or do you think lightly of the riches of the kindness and the forbearance and the patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? See, this is very, very important for us to understand. Um, when we do this, we're, we're really trampling on the kindness and, 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 the, and the great patience that God has had with us. Um, again, we, we, we tend to think, well, we'll, we'll take a marriage. Okay, here's, here's all their stuff. And if they would fix all their stuff, then we would be good, right? And it's like, you, you, you've forgotten all your stuff. And, 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 you've, and in that example there, see, you're, you're, you're not really um, 
understanding what's happened here. All the times you've been forgiven, all the patience that's been granted to you, all the mercy to you. And so just like in a marriage relationship, when you, you abuse that kindness, that love, that for, well, it starts to sting a little bit, right? And when you're on the other side of that, well, what happens? You, you don't like it. You, 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 you feel like, you know, I'm being taken advantage of here. And, and, and it's, the, it's the same concept here. Do you, do you think that God's kindness is just so easy? We must. Do, do you think him being patient with us is just, well, yeah, he should. We don't, we would never say it like that, right? We would never come out and say it just like that. But when we have an expectation that he forgives us of all our stuff, and especially in light of when we're standing there judging others for their stuff, God looks at that and goes, you know, it, it, you know, it's like, like the parable. It's like, I forgave you a million, and you can't get past ten bucks. Um, and so this is part of the reason why you, you're, you're without excuse. There, you know, there's this kind of judgment. It's inexcusable. And, and, and this is a warning to all of us. It, it, it's a warning that, you know, you need to not be this kind of person. And, and if you are, then, then you need to repent of that. You, you need to be very, very careful because you were probably very confused about whether you're the log or the speck or whether or not your sin is worse than other sin. Well, the second element we see here is there's inevitable consequences. There's inevitable consequences if you're going to uh, continue to have this kind of inexcusable judgment. Verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Well, we see here that um, there's, there's a source. There's a source of, of this, this consequence, and that source is um, stubbornness. That source is unrepentant. Heart. And, that, and that's an important thing for us to understand. Because now we stand here and we say, well, now wait a second. All of us have sinned. All of us have done things. We, we've, and, and that's a good starting point for us. And that's where God wants you to understand. Yeah, you have your sin problems. But he doesn't want to just squash down our spirit. Um, because... You know what? It's, it's an issue then of an unrepentant heart. I, I'm very thankful for the honesty of the Bible. The, the Bible's very honest. No, no, no human person would, would write a book to, to proclaim a, an ideology and, and have 99.9% .9 of its heroes, the heroes that we see in the Bible, David. David is described as a man after God's own heart. One of the best days I've ever done was when I, when I first came across, I was like, now wait a minute, I, this, this is the guy, the only thing I knew, I knew three things about David before I studied David. I knew that he you know, slew the giant. I knew that he you know, committed adultery with Bathsheba, and I knew that he had her husband killed. This is a man after God's own heart. I thought these were the two big sins. Murder and adultery. Unforgivable sins, right? How is this a man after God's own heart? Because somehow within David, and when you read the Psalms, you see a repentant heart. And, and you see that over and over and over again. Um, but because of your stubbornness, you're not willing, you're stiff-necked, and unrepentant heart, what are you doing? What you're doing is like a storehouse. You're storing up wrath. 
You're storing wrath up for yourself in the day of wrath. There is a day of wrath. Do you understand that? Well, <clears throat> here's part of the confusion in the Bible. There's a lot of days of wrath. There's a lot of judgment days. Uh, first of all, excluding the Old Testament, just future uh, days of judgment. We have in Revelation 6, we have tribulation coming. Well, well that's a judgment. We have 2 Corinthians 5.10 talks about the, uh, the judgment seat, which is a different judgment. This is between the, the sheep and the goats, or, or I'm sorry, the, the good works. Um, good works are going to be judged. Hmm, that's an interesting judgment. The sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 are, are after the tribulation when, when the nations are going to be judged. It's a different type of judgment. We're going to see angels. Angels are going to be judged. 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3. Remember, we have wicked angels, right? A whole slew of them. Demons. Satan. Um, we have Revelation 20 that talks about the great white throne judgment. We have individual judgments. When you look at what happened with Ananias and Sapphira and they lie to the Holy Spirit, they're judged on the spot, right? And they die. So there are different types of judgments there are different types of of wraths and, and so when we look at verse five here we say well there will be consequences because of your stubbornness because of an unrepentant heart and so what's happening is you're, you're storing up for yourselves your own wrath um but that's kind of a scary thought verse six who will render, starting at, verse, at the end of verse 5, the, the righteous judgment of God. Remember, God's judgment is righteous, right? Because of the righteous judgment of God, who he will render to every man according to his deeds. To those who, by perseverance in doing good, seek for the glory and the honor and immortality, eternal life. So here we are. Having this desire to have eternal life in heaven, not in hell, but in heaven. And we see this warning. Um, we see a warning. Verse 8. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteous wrath and in indignation. So, taking a step back, we, we, we know that there's days of judgment. We know that we store up for ourselves wrath. We know that the wages of sin is death. And before we get too far out, oh man, there's no hope. The hard thing for us to compartmentalize now is that there are inevitable consequences to those who then don't repent, right? And so this is what becomes very, very difficult for us as seasoned Christians. When we come into this, we're the, almost the whole time, like, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, because I'm saved from this by grace. True, if you are truly saved. We'll keep moving forward on that, but I, 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 I don't want to get too far off because I don't want us to think the wrong thing. We, we do not live under the old covenant of the if-then bilateral covenant between the Mosaic covenant. If you obey, then you will be blessed. If you disobey, then you will be cursed. We're under a new covenant. And this is why it gets a little bit tricky and confusing. The third thing we want to look at then is instinctive obedience, starting at verse 11. For there is no partiality with God. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who 
do not have the law did instinctively the things of the law. These not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So again, on that day, on that day, and you have to picture yourself having broken the law, you're standing in court, you're, you're before the judge, your sin is laid out, and the difference is you have... You have the monopoly get out of jail free card. You have the grace of God. You who have bowed the knee before the throne of God have that. But, 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 if you have not done that, then all of this is stored up wrath against you. All of this. And so we look at verse 11. Understand this. that God does not care if you are a Jew, if you are a Greek, if you are a Roman, Remember, the Jews had high honor because of the, the law. They were the carers of, of the law, right? The Jews were God's chosen people. Uh, the Greeks were the intellectual giants of the day. They're the, the, the Gentiles that are thought of as, as being wise. And the Romans are the power of the day. Okay? So you have Paul here writing to the Romans talking about the Jews, the Greeks, saying, listen, don't think that God thinks like we think. We're Americans. We're special. Uh, no, you're not special. Not at all. There's no partiality with, with, with God in that manner. All have sinned without the law. You're going to perish. If you sinned and you never saw the law of God, you're going to perish with or without the law. Or... All who have sinned under the law, well, then you're going to be judged by that law. Verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just, but the doers. And again, one of the things that we're going to see over and over again in Romans is this, this comparison to the law. And one of the points of Romans is to show you that you have not, will not, and cannot keep this law. You cannot and do not want to be justified by the law. You want to be justified by faith. You don't want to play under the old covenant, under the old law. You want to be under the new covenant. But at this point, here's where we are. And God says, look, if, if you want to be judged by the law, then you will be judged by the law. But make no mistake, you'll be judged even if you've never heard the law. You'll just be judged in a, in a different manner. Why? Verse 15, for it's written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, their, in their thoughts. See, everybody wants to say that there's no really objective moral truth, right, nowadays, the postmodern mantra, or that, well, people didn't know they were on an island, or it doesn't matter where you are. Just, just look at kids. You don't have to train a child. Uh, you know, I, I hate using it as an example because I love them so much and they crack me up and are an absolute joy. But I've got you know my my nephews and you know I get to see them running around and you know what do little boys do? And they're you know four and five. They do stuff. They think they're being sneaky and secret, right? And they smack each other and do. They're not trying to be like wicked and evil. It's just what they do. But nobody has to tell them that you don't do that in front of us. They don't do that in front of us. They do it behind us. They don't do that in the room with us. They do it in the other room, right? And then they hide and lie and, <laughs> right? They, they, someone in their heart, they know that wasn't right. I shouldn't have hit my brother like that. Um, they know. You go on, on, on a, on a, on an island, and we, we've seen examples of this from missionaries and the Taliabu people. Uh, we had friends that went there, and here they are, and they're on this, this island, and they're living in a jungle, and they've never had the written law. And you know what they do? They go out into the, to the forest to commit adultery in secret, and they don't tell anybody. And they 
steal from people's farms at night in secret. Because they know stealing's wrong. They know adultery. They know that. Nobody told them. Because it was written in their heart. And it's an instinctive thing. Just like animals do instinctive things, so, so do we. And God has put that. And so, verse 16, God will judge the secrets of men. Oh, man. I thought at least I had my thoughts to me. You don't. Again, one of the reasons why none of us are innocent. You could show me this picture-perfect person world. Um, you still got your thoughts. And that frightens me that, that the, my thoughts are known because I don't always have the right thoughts or the, the, the right response or reactions mentally. Um, it's a lot of things that the, the, my fleshly desires of anger or frustration or, you know, with, with people um, that I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys don't know about. But, but God hears that. God knows. So we see this warning that your obedience then is not just going to be law-based. It's not just because there's a, a poster in your village. It's not because just because you have the law. It's also instinctive, and we're all accountable to that. And so there's a warning here of, of our instinctive obedience. You, you need to be obedient to that. Well, there's a fourth element here is insincere pride. Verse 17. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God, remember in the church here, even in Rome, there's going to be a, a, a strong contingency of Jews okay, that, that Paul would be addressing. And so a lot of times in these books, you're going to see a kind of a back and forth. One minute, the Gentiles are being addressed. The next minute... The, the Jews. And so at any given moment, just like you and me, here the Jews are sitting there and all of a sudden they start, you know, sitting upright with it. Oh yeah, they're getting it. They're getting it. Give it to them. Give it to them. And then like a swing, whoosh, Jews, right? And, and, and that's what takes place here. This, the shift. Okay. But if you bear the name Jew, I know you think you're special. And I know you think because you've been, you have the law and you've been going to temple and you know what it is and you've been reciting it and Gaiwana patches and all that stuff. Verse 18, and, you, and because you know his will and you approve the things that are essential, having been instructed by the law, and you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. You, you've been leading others to, uh, to the law. And a light to those who are in the darkness. You're, you're a witness, verse 20, and you, you're a corrector of the foolish. And, and you're a teacher to the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Oh, ouch. This particularly is impactful for me. You who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Are you not listening to what you're preaching? You who preach that no one else steal, do you steal? Um, you who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who, who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You see, you're confused that the good activities that you've surrounded yourself, or you, you approve the law, you, you're a guide to the blind, you're a light to those in darkness, you're a corrector of the foolish, you're a teacher, you're a preacher. You're confused that because you do those external things that you're okay. When in reality, and we're talking about what God knows here and could be things of the heart could, could be a different way of looking at it. Remember the Pharisees stole from their, from fellow Israelites in the way they, they set up the taxes. 
the, the priests stole from the Israelites in the way that they had, had temple tax, um, taxes and the way they would overcharge for, for the lamb. This is a way of, of, of stealing. They didn't sneak into people's houses and rob from them. So they're sitting there going, well, I've never stolen in my life. Yes, you have. You've done it in a different way. Tax gatherers. You, verse 23, you boast in the law through your, your breaking of the law. Do you dishonor God? Now, here's a very important. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Um, in ex insincere pride, you, you, you think you're something special. The reality is nobody's fooled, especially the non-believers. And in fact, your disobedient way is causing Gentiles to blaspheme God. Okay, so what is, what is blasphemy, right? There, there's a lot of kind of confusion of, well, what's blasphemy? I, th I thought blasphemy was, you know, well, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit's the unforgivable sin. Not exactly sure what that means, but, you know, what, what, is, what is blasphemy? Well, quick little jet tour begins with the Ten Commandments and the idea of do not take the Lord's name in vain. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. In fact, the old uh, Israelites, they wouldn't even say God's name. They wouldn't say Yahweh. Okay, so in the old Hebrew, there were no, um, there were no vowels. So Yahweh was just, you know, Y-W-H. Uh, Y-W-H. Yeah, okay. Got to remember my Hebrew here. And so they wouldn't even write it. They would just like put a line. I, I don't want to say it. I don't want to think it. I don't want to write it. Why? Because they had this reverence for the name of God. Well, the flip side of that is blasphemy, where you have no reverence, no regard, just for the name of God. Well, how does that flesh itself out? We see an example in Isaiah 36. Isaiah 36, the king of Assyria is, is coming into town and, and writes the letter to Nehemiah and says, look, we're 10 and 0. We've defeated all the other nations, all the other kings, all the other little g, all their so-called gods. And now we are going to get you to. And do you think that your God is going to deliver you? It, it's a mocking of Yahweh. That's blasphemy. The, Isaiah 37, 6. King, the king of Assyria's words are blasphemy. Isaiah 52, 5 says, my name was blasphemed. Now, that's a better understanding of what blasphemy is than just thinking in terms of, of taking the Lord's name in vain. Well, well, that is blasphemy. But it's that idea of, of this insincere rejection, mockery of God himself. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 20, is, it's the rejection of faith. The rejection of faith is rejecting of God is, is a turning to Satan is described as blasphemy. Um, see, in Mark 3, 28 and 29, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is such because it attributes the work of, of God to the work of the devil. He, it, it, it's a, a flipping around. Jesus is, is healing people and the Pharisees accuse him of being under the work of Satan. Uh, that, that was blasphemy. Remember, claiming to be God uh, was blasphemy. That's why the Pharisees and the high priests hated Jesus so much, because Jesus was proclaiming himself to be the Son of God, to be the part of the triune Godhead. Claiming to be God is blasphemy. Um, and so, every time we say or do something that gives others a false representation of who God is, his glory, his holiness, his authority, his character, then we're committing a form of blasphemy. And so we then run the risk of, because of our hip, hypocritical 
statements because of our hypocritical lifestyle that we then give opportunity to the non-believer to walk out and say, you know, those Christians, and when they start on that path, then they begin to commit blasphemy by denying and mocking God, but they're doing it because of us. That hurt. For the name of God, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles, among the non-believers, because of you. They don't like Jesus today because of me, because of you. We have to get our arms wrapped around that. It's what we've done. It's our hypocrisy. Who doesn't like the idea that somebody saved them from their sins? Died for them. Everybody likes that. No, nobody has a problem with that. Nobody has a problem with the idea of forgiveness. Somebody has a problem with the idea of grace. What they have a problem with is we violate Romans 2. That we walk around and we say, well, you've done this, this, and that. And they're sitting there going, yeah, but you've done this, this, and this. We fooled nobody. And, and the Jews at the time, well, we're Jewish and we've done this and that. And the Gentiles are going, we know who you are. And now it's Christians. It's our turn. And so back then it would have been in the form of circumcision. And we, we see then that, well, the, the fifth and final element here is inward requirement. See, the Jews would say, well, we have this circumcision. We're Jewish and we've been circumcised. Game over, we're in, right? Um, verse 25, for indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law, if you're of the Old Testament, but you, if you are a transgressor of the law, guilty, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. It's meaningless. If, therefore, the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you, though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So this is a, a, a massive theological uh, moment here. And we're just going to just gloss over it. Um, but th this is huge. This wraps up. Abrahamic covenant, this wraps up old covenant, new covenant. Uh, it's, it's in this example of Romans 2 thrown out as an illustration. Everybody knows what we're talking about here. That's the assumption that's being made. And so what's taking place here is, is God is saying, look, you think because of a name or a title, being a Jew in this case, or because of some mark some religious activity um, maybe it's you think because you're taking communion maybe it's because you were baptized maybe it's because um, who knows what what you are or you've been to church 229 Sundays in a row um, what's trying to be said here is look that's not what the value is if you want to play by that game the law game if you want to play by covenantal law, old covenant law, then you must practice every single law of the letter or die, right? Or do the sacrifices, okay? Or you can be under the law of grace. And under that, the external circumcision, which is just a symbol and a sign anyway, um, that's not what makes you, in this illustration, verse 20, a Jew. What makes you a Jew is inward 
inward. There, there's inward requirements, spiritual requirements. Verse 29, he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Um, like I said, we're not going to get into all what's being said here, but there's a massive debate uh, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, with the speciality of, of Israel uh, versus a Gentile or, or a Christian. And I, and I want us to understand and focus that, look, what saves you, what makes you redeemed, is, is not where you were born. It's, it's an inwardly thing. God doesn't want us walking around with these types of titles over and over and over again. He's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither Jew nor Greek, right? It's, it's, it's constant. Why? Because, verse 29, it's a circumcision which is that of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter, which is the law. And his praise is not from men, but from God. And so our requirement then is not one that's a external religious one. It's one that's spiritual. And this is a, a, a major changing of the garden. Our next two chapters, we're really going to get into this idea of now we're justified, not by this law, not by being Jewish, not by being circumcised, but the law of faith. This is the Reformation. The Reformation takes place because of the first four chapters in the, in the, in the book of Romans, where Luther comes and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. When we put this all together, and yes, oh man, wrath, 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 disobedient, disobedient, disobedient. I, I violated, I violated, I violated. I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. I'm not a doer, I'm not a doer. I'm a lawbreaker, I'm a lawbreaker. Yes, this is the point of what the book of Romans is trying to, to lay out. You know what? You are not righteous. You're not. Despite who you think you are whether it's your birthright, whether it's your title, you, you're not. But I have a plan. There, there's a bigger picture here. You can still be justified. It's just going to be justified by faith, not by the law, not by titles, not by works, not by deeds. It's, it's, it's a new program. It's the new covenant. And so that's why we'll take each week step by step to fully embrace and understand. But at this point of the manual, at this point of the, the handbook, we're at the warning spot. And the warning for today is be careful because there will be an excusable judgment for you if you continue to be a judgmental type of person. There will be inevitable consequences. Don't think that you are going to escape and then just kind of throw out the Jesus card. Okay? That is... Just like the Jew isn't going to throw out the Jesus card, you're not going to get to throw out the Jesus card. Why? Because you have been given instinctive obedience to do what's right. And you need to repent from insincere pride, insincere pride that might come from being uh, a preacher, I'm the son of a preacher, my daddy was a Dinkin, i have third generation Baptist, none of that matters. It's insincere pride because there's inward requirements which are spiritual. Let's pray. Lord.